No, no. Frank never allows anybody to help him. He's like an old mother hen with his bills and rents and taxes. Come on, Frank, we must go over these estimates. I'll get my papers. You'll find quantities of breakfast over there, but you must eat it all or Cook will be mortally offended. Well, I'll do my best, Maxim. <laughs> I have to go over the place with Frank just to make sure that he hasn't lost any of it. But you'll be all right, won't you? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Getting acquainted with your new home. <laughs> have a look at the Times. There's a thrilling article on what's the matter with English cricket. Oh, uh, yes. Um, well, my sister Beatrice and her husband, Giles Lacey, have invited themselves over for lunch. Today? Yes. I suppose the old girl can't wait to look you over. <laughs> You'll find her very direct. If she doesn't like you, she'll probably tell you so to your face. <laughs> Don't worry, darling. I'll be back in time to protect you from her. Goodbye, darling. Goodbye, Maxim. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for our show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Sungwon Lim, who is a CEO and co-founder of Med. Welcome to the show today. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for having me today. Uh, this is a great opportunity to share our great journey to save our cancer patients with many people. All right. So first, tell us a little bit about uh, your, your kind of research career, as well as your previous work before your current startup. Yeah, so uh, before I founded this company in Premed, I spent around like more than 10 years in, to develop a new cancer therapeutics. So um, I really enjoyed this kind of researches. So, uh, you know, the, working in a lab bench and then develop a new cancer therapeutics and then move on to the mice, mice facility and then to see that a big chunk of the tumor burden on the mice uh, actually get shrinked down with the, the drug that I uh, developed. It's amazing. It's amazing thing to see. Uh, but um, uh, more and more I go deeper inside to, to this uh, field, I realized that they are, th this is really important to come up coming up with a new therapeutics option is really important. But at the same time, there are so many people outside who are who need the treatment right now today, they don't have time for it to they don't have time to wait for a new therapeutics, they don't have time uh, they don't have money enough to afford the new therapeutics when they come in. So I just changed my mind to so what is the best way to help these kind of people who really need the treatment today. So my kind of solution was that, well, we have more than 200 FDA approved drugs out there. So how about we can optimize and personalize to find out the best uh, uh, you know, utility of what we currently have for each individual patient. So that's the kind of basic theme of this company. Makes sense. So, you know, I think when we talk about uh, cancer research and of course the clinical trials, it's, it's a big hurdle and, and certainly, uh, you know, the kinds of progress that can be made in uh, mice clinical studies are not necessarily going to be representative of larger animals and certainly humans. And there's even research that has indicated that animal studies tend to sometimes over, um, you know, kind of inflate the, the likelihood of, you know, positive impact to humans, for instance. Talk about um, how approaching um, this from a canine, uh, from the pet or approach, actually helps uh, indirectly or directly to the humans uh, and actually bypasses some of the challenges in terms of FDA. That is a great question. So that's, uh, you've actually covered uh, this question. Will, this answer will cover why we are starting with this pet and then we are, why we are very interested in working in, uh, with a vet oncologist here. So. First of all, you point out a great thing. So there is discrepancy with, with the, between the animal model in the lab facility and then the, what is actually happening inside the human body. So because animal models are artificially made, uh, so we inject a human cancer to the back of the mice for the liver cancer, something like that, because we can measure the tumor size very um, you know, the conveniently on the, on the mice back. So that's it's a kind of like tumor, 
you know, the, the tumor generation, tumor development is artificial. And then the size of the tumor, the site of the tumor is also artificial. So that's why we see a lot of, you know, immune systems are all, all different between the animals and then the human. So that's why we are uh, seeing a very you know, big discrepancy. But here in the in this in this uh, animal world, the pet cancer patients, these are the patients. These are not the models. So they the, their cancers are naturally occurred, uh, and they live with a human uh, environment. So that's uh, that's why this is a lot more closer to what's actually happening inside the human body. So she, and then you can actually there are tons of research papers out there, uh, which, uh, you know, the proves that human cancer is very similar to the dog cancer. So that's why NIH actually have been working really hard for the last 12, 20 years to do this comparative oncology program. So trying to take a look into the veterinary space and then find out the good, useful information and then translate it to the human cancer. So what we are doing here uh, at Imprimat is actually the um, very important in the comparative oncology concept. So we are saving out, but we don't use the animal as our model to develop a kind of like bridge to go to go to the human. So we are, our best goal here, our first priority is to save our pet cancer patients. We see these, these animal as our patients. So we do, we do our best to, uh, to come up with the best technology to uh, actually treat these cancer patients here. And then if, if the database is collected, uh, we can, actually translate into once we clinically validate our technology here and then once we hit the kind of confidence level, uh, confident enough to move on to the market in the vet space, then we know how to approach to tackle this specific cancer, for example, lymphoma. Then we, we know how we can tackle to and then translate into the human side and then which kind of component we need to uh, combine into this prediction model. So that's how we move forward from here to there, but everything is in parallel. So, so it, it makes perfect sense. And, and again, I think there's a kind of a genius to this approach and model. Uh, you know, when it comes to pets, dogs, cats, they're not subject to the same level of scrutiny, FDA scrutiny and the preclinical trials and the, you know, trial one, two, three, and also doesn't have the embedded kind of cost structure of the maturity. So there's a lot more kind of uh, fast pace, faster acceleration and, and faster result as a result of that, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, but I wanted to talk about one piece that's I think really critical uh, is that the approach you guys are taking is like you said before, cell-based, yep. which uh, is fundamentally a game changer because other biotech companies that are, let's say in similar, whether it's dogs or humans, they're looking at more from a genomics uh, or genetic side of the cancer mm -hmm. research. Talk about why that cell base is so critical. Yeah, so that's another kind of differentiating, fact, differentiating factor from our company to the other companies. So you point out the right thing. So they, most of like other precision medicine companies, even in the human side, more than 90% of the precision medicine companies are taking a look into the gen, gene information. So genetic mutation is very, very important and then crucial information that we need to have. But it's a snapshot of the cancer. Cancer starts with a gene, a gene, some kind of abnormal gene, but it's not guaranteed that abnormal gene produces abnormal protein. And that that is a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one correlation to the actual abnormal behavior of a cancer cell. There are a lot of, you know, the interactions between the abnormal protein and with a normal DNA, normal protein, and all these kind of network. It is nearly impossible to simulate all these kind of interactions inside what is happening inside cells. Okay, well, if that's a, uh, if the DNA mutation trying to predict the cell's behavior to the drug, and then, then predict what's actually happening inside the body, that's a, so long. So, okay, well, regardless of what's happening inside the cells with the like, different, you know, the mutation in the gene. Let's see a cancer cell as a system. And then let's take a look into how this cancer cell directly, you know, uh, have uh, directly interact with, uh, against the cancer, anti-cancer drugs. So we actually keep the cancer cells alive and then treat the drug, various different kind types of drugs onto the patient's cancer cells. And then to see the, how this cancer cell actually reacts to this, each drug and then each drug combination. So uh, we, I think uh, this kind of, we, we are not, you know, de-evaluate the DNA. We, are, we, 
we definitely appreciate the DNA, but DNA itself is not enough. We need to combine the cell information and then add some kind of DNA information together. Well, you know, to me, I think the analogy I think about is, uh, you know, weather forecasts, both kind of historic as well as forward thinking. So if you look at average, you know, precipitation within a region the last hundred years, isn't necessarily going to be a good predictor of what's going to happen tomorrow or the next week. Uh, but it's this notion of, uh, you know, the, the different derivatives or permutations, like you said, I mean, the, the possibilities are almost endless. Now, when you guys are analyzing the, the reaction to those uh, cancer cells, you mentioned systems. So it's not just looking at the cancer cells, but also the interaction with healthy cells as well. So how do you ensure that you're looking at it from kind of a total impact, which again, from a human study at some point is going to be important? You may also like our quarterly Astro Perkins event that brings some of the most notable experts and category leading startups in the area of sustainability and human survival on Earth and in space. To register, visit astroperkins.com forward slash events. Yeah, I think that's also another great point. So the interaction with another like healthy cells is also important. And what, what the other like normal cells happening, uh, doing inside this patient body is also very important. So right now we are taking a look into the, the cancer cells only and the cancer, cancer cells reaction to the drugs. That's, what, what, uh, that's one information that, you, that we are getting uh, by making the cancer cells alive outside of the body. That's one of our key technology here. But we really, really appreciate what you just mentioned. We need to take a look into the cancer cell as a system and also the body as a system. So that's why we need to, we, we are incorporating the patient information like age, uh, gender, and breed for dogs, uh, and then also the cancer stage, and then the immunophenotyping, what kind of, you know, the proteins are expressed on this patient's cancer cells. We, may, we, we quantify all these kind of factors together and then put that into our machine learning black box and then let the computer, let the com computer simulate what is the prediction scores for this each drug. So that's, that's why I think this is why we need AI here because there are so many information we need to incorporate. We have, I think so far human has done enough for the rational approach to the cancer. I think this now cancer is, should be the engineering approach. So we're going to come back to the AI in, in, in just a second, because sure. I, that, that to, to me is very exciting. Uh, because of the, the, the current focus around canines, um, there's got to be some stories. So can you give us maybe one or two stories of maybe successes? Uh, with this, this, you know, this has uh, helped maybe a dog recover and the kind of reaction from the pet owners. Oh, yeah. So we have... Uh, I can share like one story with a uh, uh, dog named Ellie. So Ellie was a uh, 11.5 years female terrier mix. And unfortunately she was diagnosed with a uh, high grade lymphoma, which is hard to treat. And then uh, from Seattle hospital, uh, a doctor named called Dr. Kevin Choi, uh, he sent us a sample, Ellie's sample to us. Uh, and then we, run, we ran this, uh, our imprimat service. And then we found out that um, so for, uh, when, when we received the sample, Dr. Kevin Choi uh, shared the medical record together with us. Uh, so, and then the medical record says, if this is a B-cell lymphoma, I'm going to treat with this certain drug. So, and then we ran the, our assay and then we recognized that this is not a B-cell, this is T-cell lymphoma, which is even more, even more difficult to treat. And then the drug that he was trying to use it was ranked as weak category. Mm. So we sent out the report to the, to the doctor and then the doctor was sitting together with Ellie's mom and then they were discussing and then they select the second best treatment, uh, which was the, 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 uh, the drug called chlorambucil. And then because chlorambucil was an inexpensive pill, it's, mm. it can be orally prescribed and it's a lot, a lot cheaper than the the best, uh, the top, top uh, efficacy predictive drug. So what happened? So after six months later, uh, Dr. Kevin Cho actually sent us an email with a photo with a graduation hat. Uh, you know, Ellie finished all the chemotherapy protocol. She's healthy. She does not have to come to the regular visit to the hospital. 
And then the, he actually mentioned the Columbia seal based on his experience. It's not a drug to go because mm. it was ineffective to in, ineffect, uh, it was not effective to all the patients that he treated before, but he just trusted our report and then let's give a shot. And then actually uh, we extended Ellie's life more than eight months in a healthy condition. So this is the one great story. Yeah, well, that, that really is a great story. And I think part of the reason it's also a great story is that, you know, doctors are um, also in, in their way pattern, you know, they're, uh, 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 be, you know, uh, they are professions who uh, rely on their pattern, which is their experience. So if their experience indicates a certain set of uh, drugs being effective or not effective, they're going to continue that pattern until new information becomes available. And this is exactly what you guys are doing. And it was very enlightening because it, it's providing uh, results before you actually administer it. So, you know, having to, without having to go through the process of, you know, being on a certain therapy for so, so long before realizing that it's not effective, uh, specific to that dog and that specific type of, you know, cancer. I, I think this is a huge time saving and also just emotional distress that the family owners don't have to go through unnecessarily. Exactly. Uh, recently, uh, at the time of the recording of this interview, which is uh, in kind of late May, your company uh, made a big announcement about the advanced precision medicine service for canine. This is what we're talking about. This is the mm -hmm. he, um, hematopoietic cancers. Can you uh, tell us more about the chemo response prediction? Exactly, you know what we talked about around AI side mm -hmm. and the emo, uh, immunophenotyping for yeah. uh, canine lymphoma. Uh, mm -hmm. which is based on a clinical study with 150 vets, uh, vet, veterinary oncologists, and there are, I guess, uh, some 2,000 canine patients. Right. So uh, our, our service is divided into, our service includes the, what you just mentioned, uh, the drugs, drug, drug, drug reaction, uh, the evaluation, drug sensitivity, we call it it's a drug sensitivity test. So keep the cancer cells alive from the patient and then test all different drugs. So that's a drug sensitivity test. And then immunophenotyping test is uh, just from Ellie's example, if this is a B cell lymphoma or T cell lymphoma, because this is very important information to the doctors because B cell lymphoma is, has a better uh, prognostic information. So this is a great information to deliver with uh, to the to the pet owners. So these are the kind of uh, the tests that we are doing here. And then what we, we have the, the comprehensive service that includes all these kind of parts. Um, and then the drug sensitivity, immunophenotyping, all these are the great input variables for our AI machine learning model to do the very accurate uh, prediction. Our prediction, uh, our prediction is getting better and better. Currently it's around 80% like accurate. Uh, and then, so, I really want to emphasize that not only the single drug, like each drug uh, response prediction, but also what we can do is that uh, you point out the right thing. Doctors have a gold standard here for the canine hematopoietic cancer cells, uh, cancers like lymphoma and leukemia. Doctor has a gold standard called CHOP chemotherapy. It's a combination of four different drugs. They always, they just, okay, we, before our service, they usually just, okay, Canine lymphoma, chop. Canine leukemia, chop. Something like that. Uh, but right now, they, we definitely not all the patients are responsive to the chop. So we we hear the doctors, and then we really want to have give them a really good value about the gold standard. So what we can provide also is that throughout the time course of this CHOP chemotherapy, there is a certain like, you know, very well established protocol. Throughout this time course, what is the likelihood of patient's response to this CHOP? And then once this patient respond to the CHOP, and then if, it, it, if, if you can see the tumor size shrink down to the normal size, which we call complete remission, after this remission, Usually the blood cancer is relapses. So when does the cancer, when, when does the cancer, uh, this patient cancer will relapse? So we can provide this kind of time course efficacy prediction too for the gold standard. So these are the kind of information to the doctors. And then this, this is definitely uh, getting a great feedback from the community right now. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, really exciting. I, and I think, um, you know, one of the things that, that to me is a question that needs to be asked uh, is there is a there is another company um, called PhytoCure or mm -hmm. One Health Company 
Um, and I wonder how their approach is similar, dissimilar, of course, I, I'm not sure if they're necessarily focused on the cell side, but you know, in terms of this canine cancer approach and using that data to enrich the machine learning uh, algorithms uh, for, for the better prediction and, and accuracy. Don't forget to visit astroprogins.com to register for our next quarterly events. Past and current speakers include Damian Vaughn, former NFL player, Neil Gregory, Chief Thought Leadership Officer at the IFC World Bank, and many more. To register, visit astroprogins.com and click on events. Sure. Uh, I think both of the companies, uh, VitaCure and Imprimat, we both have uh, one goal, trying to save our canine can dog and cat cancer patients to live longer and then have a ha happy life uh, with, uh, uh, with pet, pet parents. Uh, but two companies are very, very different for their approach. So as you mentioned, we, we use our cell-based assay, uh, which is proprietary. We are the only one company who can keep the cancer cells alive outside of the body. Mm -hmm. uh, without this technology, no one can actually uh, do the cell-based assay. Uh, the VitaCure has a, you know, uh, the, you know, DNA sequencing was very established in the human side, DNA sequencing uh, approach. So that's the biggest difference here. And another big difference here is that we are testing, we are actually testing the drugs on these cancer cells uh, this, we, we, we say we can be, we are more evidence-based and then uh, it's uh, so in the drugs that we are testing, drugs that are listed up in our reports, those are the currently available chemotherapy drugs that are widely and popularly being already being used in the clinic. Uh, what VitoCure is trying to bring in is that the human drugs, more like uh, advanced drug, more targeted drugs, uh, but which are not being very popular in the vet space because it's not clinically validated. Uh, there was no like in a last number of clinical trials that it's approved in human side, but it does not guarantee that uh, the protocol that we set up for the human is actually being directly applied for the, or the, the for the dog cancer patients. So, uh, but they have a brilliant, I think they have a brilliant business model. That's like, if this is the human drug, which is hard to get, mm -hmm. they are partners, partnered with a, a compounding company. Mm -hmm. They can help this, they can help this patient can get the human uh, drug more easily. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and certainly for the pet owners, I mean, it gives them that hope, right? Uh, that mm -hmm. uh, before they didn't have access to. Uh, let's uh, switch gears a little bit in terms of some of your backers. I think Tim Draper, founding partner at Draper Associates, is an investor. And I wonder why he is excited about investing and supporting uh, Imprimed. Sure. Um, Tim, um, yeah, I remember all of these kind of like in his investment uh, the days. And we are we were still very closely uh, communicating each other. He is a strong believer of our company can actually eventually help the human patients too, human cancer patients too. So our short-term goal is definitely we are continue to saving our dogs and cat cancer patients. Uh, and then we really want to, the knowledge and then the experience we collect from here in this vet oncology space, we really want to uh, move on to the humans, uh, human cancer patients. So our actually our company's catchphrase is that let's save our pet cancer patients first and then pet owners next. So. I think he is a strong advocate for this. Yeah. So speaking of a uh, longer term product roadmap is that right now you guys are focused on, um, you know, FDA approved, um, you know, chemotherapy, right? And yeah. I wonder, you know, in addition to the available, uh, I think you refer to it as uh, this kind of, uh, was it, uh, I forget what you refer to, but it was a cocktail of drugs, right? That the gold standard, mm -hmm. but how would uh, the data set and the algorithms uh, that are being developed help potentially in the future to inform for you know new potential pharmaceuticals and new for potential therapies that are yet to be de yet to be developed but because you're providing new data set and studies that actually helps to better target and create new formularies that's a very exciting question so our platform itself current uh, you know itself has a wide variety, wide range of applications. So 
for example, we, we have a potential to expand to the other types of cancer drugs. We are just focusing on the lymphoma drugs, which are 16 drugs. But we definitely we can we can expand to the other human drugs that like you know Phytocure can bring in if the pet owners wants to use that. Uh, if the pet community oncology community is widely open to this uh, more targeted small molecules, we can definitely we are actually helping preparing for that. So we have our internal data. Um, and then, so if there is another like antibody, uh, you know, the drug, new drug, we can definitely expand our drug panel for that. So that's what we can provide our service to the, the clinics directly. Before the human pharmaceutical companies or veterinary pharmaceutical companies, uh, this, this is even another kind of exciting business model that what we can do is we can help the pharmaceutical companies to do the better clinical trial. Mm. We can help them. We can help them. They. Uh, we can help them to design a better clinical trial with a better, like more precise uh, the inclusion criteria. For example, if they have uh, three like best can compound candidates, they probably need to like go through the each of each of the compound to see the which one is the best for the the actual cancer patients. What we can do is that we receive those three compound, and then we can use we can add that to our drug panel. And then within three or four months, we can test around like 300 different dog cancer patients, specific cancer patients, uh, tumor cells. We, so, we already proved that there is a good correlation of our, uh, our, model, our platform to what is actually happening inside the body. So we can find out which one is the best for the specific patient and if who are the best responder, what is the profiling, what is the genetic profiling, what is the protein profiling, something like that. And then so that we can actually let the doc, well, let, and then also we can find out that usually the new drug does not come into the market by itself. It always, com it always run the clinical trial with combining with the conventional drugs. So what is the best synergistic drug combination for this, the best compound? So this is how we can uh, work with pharmaceutical companies and then we are actually having a good conversation with some of them. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, very exciting because you're talking about lowering cost structure, accelerating uh, speed to market, product development cycles, and of course, efficacy and effectiveness. So very, very exciting. So my last question for you is uh, lessons learned in terms of any product or project failure and insights that you can share with us. Yeah, well, you know, uh, we, we provide our service for free for the last three years until we actually get the competence level that we, we, we're a good amount, we have a good amount of data and then uh, have a good amount of feedback from the, our customers who are the veterinary cancer doctors. And then, then we launched our service, our paid service early this year. And then like, you know, this is, I think this is what all the companies out there experience freemium to the premium, the free service to pay service is definitely painful. Uh, and then who were the doctors who were very like, strong advocates. We expected that this doctor will definitely use our service. And we, we experienced some kind of disappointment, mm. but you know, it's what it is. And then I think our conversion rate is pretty high. Uh, th that is our job to let them set more satisfied and then we can expand to the new clinic with a better service. That's a really very practical insight. I appreciate that. So with that, uh, we have been joined by Dr. Songwon Lim, who is the CEO of Impermed. Thanks for joining today. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.